I've always, I've had to constantly prove. And if you don't have the opportunities to go out there to do it, then you have to wait. Most people thought I was 200 and some pounds. I played at 185 pounds, 5'9". And I was run inside, run outside and catch the ball. Hell, I was blocking too. I had to yeah. block Reggie White, Kevin Green, one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, listen. Good luck with that. Yeah, tell me about it. I used to get, get in their way. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Get out of here. Behind the mask. What up, my boy? What's good, family? Another day in paradise. You know what it is. Yeah, I can tell. You looking like paradise. New mm -hmm. outfit alert. You know what I'm saying? Still your favorite plus size model. You know what I'm saying? Representing BTM to the fullest. Well, plus size model. We got to get to the next guest because we got somebody came off up in the lounge. Facts, facts. This next guest was a first round pick of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Mm -hmm. Three time pro bowler who rushed for over 10,000 yards in his career. The first black former player, NFL legend, to not only play for a team that he enjoyed playing for, but now he has ownership, mm -hmm. minority stake. Mm -hmm. For all of his accomplishments that he's done on and off the field, he's made even a larger impact off when it comes to Warwick Dunn's charities and his program home for the holidays. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BTM Lounge. Give it up for your favorite Atlanta Falcon, Warwick Dunn. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Y'all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Say, man, hey, but get your numbers right, man. I'm 37 yards shy of 11,000. So let's get that right, okay, player? Ain't no short change. No, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. He's still hating. He hating. He hating. What's up with these running back? Hey, Garrison man. Hurst was here a few weeks ago. He checking me on shorting him on some yards. Hey, man. That, I, I, that means a lot. I guess it do. That's what gets you paid, huh? Huh, bro? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's the that boot. Huh, bro? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Man. Great uh, to have you in the lounge, man. You know, I appreciate you You, you were hard to catch up on the field, but even hard to, to catch up to yeah. get you in the lounge, bro. Well, I know it's been a long time coming, just on the move, you know, the pandemic, all that, but just a lot of just a lot of moving parts, just traveling, helping people and doing a lot of different things and trying to spend time with family. So you're trying to balance all of that. Yeah. But I'm um, I'm good. We worked it out. I'm I'm here and uh, you know, getting ready to have a big surprise next week. So it's it's a good time. Bro, I, let's take a little travel back in time because you've accomplished so much. Yeah, in a in a good period of time, and you know it's not necessarily short. But did you know as a as the older man now? Did you know as the younger man that you would become as successful as you are, just outside of the field and everything else that you were doing when you were younger? I would say no. I had no idea, you know, what I was doing, what the path that I was taking. I mean, you got to think, early in my career, even in college, I mean, I was really focused more on family, just making sure that I can be there for my brothers and sisters. And just over the years, I think, you know, different people come into your life and they mentor you. And I've had great uh, mentors, but, you know, it's been strategic how people have been placed in my life, seems like, that really help guide me and, and push me in different directions. And, you know, you never know what the journey is and... and you know, my journey took me to go to counseling. Just mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of things that I had no idea, but I never thought that I'd be in this position that I am today. Mm -hmm. Faced a lot of adversity as a young man. Um, overcame that adver adversity to become a successful older man. So in that journey where there's some things that you went through where you felt like, you know what, I don't know if I can keep it going. No, I, I grew up with a lot of confidence when you're only like yay high and you're playing ball, you know, chip on your shoulder all the time. You always got to prove to people. The thing is, when, if I didn't know something, I always, you know, went to learn or, or I was open to hearing someone else, what they had to say and learn from them. So for me, it was all about just, you know, 
keeping your mind and your ears open to being open to learning. Like for an example, even after I finished my career, to earn the respect of my other partners, I went and got my MBA at Emory mm -hmm. here in Atlanta. And I only did that because I wanted to earn their respect, that I wanted to learn, you know, the business concepts and, you know, the lingo so that, you know, I can, they can feel comfortable that I'm, I am at least trying to understand their journey. I mean, they've been businessmen. So for me, it's just... Reverse, but it also taught me more about you know everyday business, running a charity, and those things. So it's uh, it's a benefit. We're gonna get into the charity in a bit. I want to yeah. go back a little bit too, man, to to your days at Florida State. And I'm gonna date myself here in a second, but <laughs> three time All ACC player at Florida State, yeah, over a thousand yards rushing three consecutive years. But what I remember from work done aside from seeing you play at Florida State every yeah. weekend. I remember uh, Bill Walsh college football <laughs> used to be, used oh to be nice on college football because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, we be the dog playing the game yeah, and everything. Yeah. You was unstoppable, bro. But that just shows how ill you were on the field as well. Translate, uh, transcended to the league also. But how did it feel to be an all-time great at Florida State and then later get your jersey retired along the likes of uh, uh, Charlie Ward and, and Deion Sanders, yeah. Ron Simmons, guys like that? Well... I would tell you from the beginning, I never thought that I can, you know, go to Florida State and, and excel. I mm -hmm. mean, I was, like I said, I was five, nine, 150 some pounds my freshman year of college. And I had to make a deal with Coach Bowden. Mm -hmm. I mean, they recruited me to play defensive back because they said, well, you can be the next Terrell Buckley, Deion Sanders. Mm -hmm. I was like, no. I want to be work done, right? And You ain't tell them that. I promise you. I promise you. I made a deal with Coach Bowden, though. I said, Coach, I'll come to Florida State if you give me an opportunity to play running back. If mm -hmm. it doesn't work out, then I'll move the defensive back. And after the first week, I was straight offense because I was I bust long runs on the first team defense and mm -hmm. those things after, like, the third or fourth day of camp, and that was it. Yeah. Was Marvin yeah. Jones on that defense, too? No, thank goodness Shade Tree left, okay? <laughs> I'm happy he left. I was about to do my fact check over here and see if you... <laughs> no, they talked about him a lot my freshman year. Yeah. Because of... And I watched a lot of film of him tackling guys and not going to the ground. I mean, he was, like, stupid crazy. But, um, you know, just given the opportunity that I had my freshman year, I think I just took advantage of it. And then just over the course of time, I mean, I, I went and talked to Coach Bowden my sophomore year. We halfway through the year, and I went up to him. I said, "Have you know, when the last time you guys had a 1,000-yard rusher? Yeah. And I mean, he told me, I, I forget what he said, but I said, okay, I'm going to try to go get that. Yeah. And then that happened. Then after that, I mean, I was just so confident in that I can, I can do this. I got a great player behind me who's always going to be on my heels that I got to make sure that I'm always playing my best. So that really pushed me to, to be the best that I can be. And the reality is I was just having fun. I mean, yeah. I was just I, I was just trying to make guys miss. I played, you know, when I was playing, when I was young, playing back in Baton Rouge on the street or in, in the field, I wasn't trying to get touched at all. <laughs> I was... I was getting skinny. He should know that. This joke here. <laughs> <sighs> we only want to talk about that, though. We're going to get it soon. We're going to get it soon. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was fun, though. It's like I played with the passion that I was so determined to prove. And I think, you know, year in and year out, well, week in and week out, every day I was always trying to prove that I belong, that I can play with, you, with, you, with them. And I didn't think I could ever play pro ball until actually my senior year, or my after my junior year, because yeah. everyone thought I was going to leave school. Yeah, and, and just to, I think about some of the guys who were on that team. Mm -hmm. Well, Amp Lee was before you, right? Amp was before me, yes. Yeah, he was before you, but he he didn't even have 1,000 yards. Did yeah. he have 1,000 yards throughout uh, his career, maybe? I, I, don't I don't think, think so. so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Sean Jackson was there. Marquette Smith was there. He was like a uh, um, high school player of the year, Gator, all United Nations. And your home, your homeboy was there too, who played behind you. 
Oh, was uh, it Rock Preston? Rock Preston. Yeah, he's from Louisiana there. too, right? No, no, he's from uh, Florida, down in Miami area. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, Rock I, used to dive in the end zone when he scored. I remember that. Rock was Rock was cold. He, he was cold blooded, man. Was cold. Money. That's why it's like if I don't score, he gonna come in and score. <laughs> so we were always competing, like who's gonna get to the zone first. Yeah. But Rock, I mean, I, I give him a a lot of he, he pushed me to be the best that I can be. And I, I mean, I love and respect him and. You know his game was was real, so we complimented each other. I think so. If I, something happens to happen to me, he came on and he made it happen. We never missed a beat. So I think we complimented each other because we were competitive, but we were just having fun. I mean, yeah. we didn't think we were any better. I was just like, hey, if, if I'm gonna do it, I know he's gonna do it. If, if he didn't do it, he knew that I was gonna do it. So we we just had fun. We we enjoyed it though. Yeah, that's dope, bro. Unselfish, knowing that the job was gonna get done. Regardless, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. you look at what you guys ended up doing at Florida State, and you was drafted first round, Bucks ninety seven. Yeah. Coming on to that team, you know we all know what happened when eventually they won it, but oh, it was some big personalities on that team. You look at, <laughs> you look at, you know. Derrick Brooks ain't so much the big personality. His presence is big. Right, right. But you look at Warren Sapp. Mm -hmm. Eventually, y'all got uh, Keyshawn Johnson came on the team. Oh, yeah. God, who were some of the other guys on there? Yeah, what? Barber was on there. Yeah, Barber was on there. Yeah, That's some big names. Lynch. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lynch. All-star. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we had some, we had, you know, we had some really good players, and it was a lot of personality. I mean, mm -hmm. how did you deal with that, that personality though? Because you more so reserved, but you got, I bet Sap was just <laughs> at it all day. Listen, Sap was always at it. Oh, don't man. be, don't be the rookie, right? right. When you come in on a rookie, oh, yeah, he gonna and, give you the business. Huh? Oh, he gonna give you the business, and you know, back then hazing was, you know, that was like a, a fun thing. Yeah. You know, we did things, they messed with us and those things. But you know, I, I think playing against him at Miami, you know, I, I think he respect my game. I mean, he was just, you know, being Warren Sapp, yeah. you know, crazy and silly, and you know, I think you know, with Coach Dungey there, who who I would say probably also had to like try to manage. Mm. You know, which Sapp was because, impressive. Yeah, I mean he. I mean, but when you respect a guy like that, you you, yeah. you do what you can. And I think Sap did a really good job of really managing. You know, I, I say he crazy. You know, he. We all know him, right? Yeah. So <laughs> he is who he is. I love him to death. But did, did he did he ever get you on your rookie year when you came in? Because it's typical. Everybody, you got to mess with the rookies. Yeah, he, he, he messed with me all the time. He messed with me all the time. But I, I won't say anything, but I had to get him back, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no lies in the lab. No you got to get to lab, him, baby. Ain't no, it ain't no lies, man. It ain't no lies. Give, no, give, lies what happened? How you get him back? Well, he just... Or what you do to make him to hold him off? Like, just chill out, man. No, nah, he just, you know, he just always mess with me. Mess with me, mess with me. And I just got tired one day. Yeah. That's all. I just got tired one day. And... That didn't make him stop, though. Did oh, you yes, say it, something to him? Or? Oh, yeah. I, 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 PG, baby. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all good. It's all good. It's yeah, down, yeah. but we good, though. We good. Facts, you know? he, but the thing is, you know, Sap, you know, I, he, re, I mean, I, I, he respects me, the game. I respect him. I mean, that's, I call him, he called me little fella. He big, big mm -hmm. guy to me, big fella. I mean, he loves my grandmother, wants to, you know, eat her cooking, play, you know, cards with her. So, I mean, he's he's yeah. somebody that, you know, I, I love and respect. I mean, he's just crazy. And, you know, we were all in that era where yeah. they're going to try you. Just like, I'm from the boot, though. You know, we a little different down there. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the boot in the house. One yeah. thing I will say, I think uh, he's misunderstood because if he's on your side and he has love for you, that love is never gonna change. Oh, not at all. You know what I'm saying? Not at all. And but if he don't rock with you, he'll oh, yeah. let it be known. Oh yeah. I don't mess with you. Yeah, yeah no, he he'll fight for you. I Absolutely. Mean, he'll, he'll have your back. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I mean, on that field though, you know, he was like one of those guys that you know he understood the game, knew the ins and outs, but he was challenging his other teammates. Hey, mm -hmm. we all we in this together. We gotta nice. come together and and do your part. And I just think he also challenged the offense too. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, we practice against you guys. Hey, you got to come on. Yeah. Do this. This is how they plan you. Cho 
he really helped linemen and those things, you know, just be better. Just right. giving them a little tips. So, yeah. I man, I appreciate him. He crazy. You know, yeah. that's my boy. <laughs> that's my boy, though. Well, you got Sap uh, Bear, Hall yeah. of Famer. Yep. Um, when you retired, though, you held several Falcons franchise records, including total playoff rushing yards, uh, playoff rushing TV, TDs, playoff rushing yards per game, and then with the Bucks, you also held records for all-purpose yards in the playoff game, plus a thousand plus yard rushing games. Wow! Total greatness. And I know you don't keep up with your stats, bro, but we wow. researched it. We know some of these things. Wow. Yeah. Now, with that caliber of play. Two franchises, only two right. fran uh, franchises you play for. Why do you think Warwick Dunn's name is not talked about more when you, we talk about Hall of Fame? Well, I just think because I played in the era when, you know, this era is a lot different, more and open. But you got to think, when I came in my, like I said, my rookie year, I was 5'9", 170-some pounds when I got drafted. And I wasn't one of those guys who got the ball you know, consistently, because I had to prove week in and week out that I can run the ball, that mm. I can play, that I can take the pounding. Mm. And, you know, it, it took some time for them to really believe I can do that. And, you know, it really came to fruition, I think, at my third year, Mike Allstott, he got injured, and he was out like eight, nine games. And then I just went on a tear. I rushed for almost like a 1,000 yards in those nine games. And I think then they knew, okay, he could play every down. He can run inside, he can run outside, and I can catch the ball. So I just think then is when they really started to open up. And it's just, you have to constantly prove yourself week in and week out. And, you know, after Tampa, I came to Atlanta, and, you know, I had to prove here, too, that I can, with Dan Reese, run inside, take the pound. I mean, one time Dan was like, oh, you sore? It's like, sore. <laughs> No, why, why should I be sore? I just had like 25 carries for, you know, 100 and something. And he couldn't believe it, honestly. I, he was just like, you're not sore? Like, Cause Dan Reeves used to like to pound the rock, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, he wanted to boom, boom down here. And he liked big backs. So, yeah. you know, for me to come here and, and be undersized and play in that system that he was in, I mean, I, I had to prove to him. And, you know, I just feel like I'm not talked about because I've always, I've had to constantly prove. And if you don't have the opportunities to go out there to do it, then you have to wait. Most people yeah. thought I was 200 and some pounds. I played at 185 pounds, 5'9". Mm -hmm. And I was run inside, run outside and catch the ball. Hell, I was blocking too. I had yeah. to block Reggie White, Kevin Green, one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, listen. Good luck with that. Yeah, tell me about it. I used to get, get in their way. I mean, <laughs> you know, get out of here. Listen, I mean, I used to get in this way because I'm not going to stop them. Right. But three step drop, quarterback got three, you got three seconds. Get you the ball. Let out. it go. Huh? Let, that, let that thing go. It might it, be in your best interest. Yeah, all day, right? So, I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going to stop anybody, right. but I was going to get in their way and, and distract them. But, you know. But you also think, too, I had a really good understanding of the game. I learned football so early. I mean, we were calling audibles when I was 10 years old, line of scrimmage, checking the ball. In right? the field, in the streets. Yeah, but when I played organized, we, we were checking at the line of scrimmage, changing the play at the line of scrimmage. Who do you read? So I started really understanding, you know, with safeties, the linebackers and those things. And it just continued to evolve. So, like in high school, I was quarterback. So now, when you play quarterback, you got to really see the field and understand where everybody's going to be at. And you know, doing that, I think it just helped me overall to really understand. Oh, if my guy's supposed to have blocked this guy, that guy. So I know the free guy. If I'm get if I get there, I know who that guy is. Yeah. I knew that was my guy that I was going to have to make miss, and I wasn't going to let nobody tackle me one on one. Period. Speaking of that, <laughs> we always got to ask the backs that come on to play. He just he gotta, he hey, gotta he look said. at me with like. Speaking yeah. of that, you ever went against this Joker? All day. And what yeah. happened? Because you know he be thinking he, you know. Oh. What you gave him the business? Oh, listen, Cincinnati. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm running out of bounds. You know, uh -huh. I'm running to the sideline. He dove at me to hit me while I'm running <laughs> up, and I still I. I Jumped up, so like, 
in in the air. I was like, Takia! <laughs> <laughs> you remember? I was like, in the air. I was like, Takia! <laughs> I got down and we walking back. I'm like, what you doing? He was like, that's so he just couldn't even say nothing. Hey, bro. You caught <laughs> air? <laughs> you made him catch air? All day. Huh? Man, why you dapping him up, man? What's the... Nah, let me tell you this, though. <laughs> let me tell you my version of the story. What's your version? So this is, like, we'll mention this every, you know, we'll talk about it. So it really started our coach, Mark Duffner. Hey, hey, I'm telling you right now, this kid work done, I've never seen anybody get a clean shot on him. I'm talking about, bro, he was in there just stroking you big time. <laughs> oh. Pause. <laughs> but, but I'm just like, and the more and more I kept Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I right, Friday, I'm looking at film. Never saw anybody hit him square on. Mm. And I was like, Coach, I really don't like how you was installing that fear into everybody. Mm. Like, I'm going to take him out and you're going to see it. So <laughs> we get to Sunday. And I'm like, man, we got these damn bucks coming off and I'm going to kill him. Bro, they ran. It was a running play going to the left. And he was going, and, and you know, the respect, I respect everybody. Like, not everybody, but <laughs> I just wanted to hit him. So I saw him going out of bounds, and I'm like, man, this my chance to really, like, put some wood on this dude. So he saw me, and he was easing up, and I was like, I don't see nothing, but I'm finna de demolish him. Bro, he saw I wasn't easing up. He sped back up, <laughs> and then he jumped out of bounds. And I tried to get him. He jumped up, and I just caught all air. <laughs> them mud and everything go all in my face. And I get up, and I heard him. He was like, Takeo, Takeo, come on, man. What you doing, man? And I felt, he made me feel so bad, bro. I was just like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh I went man. back to the huddle, dog. I, I couldn't even look at you, bro. Oh, I know. He was like, man, leave, the hell. leave me the hell alone. Oh, man. I was so hot, man. But you didn't call it. Hey, I wasn't going to, I wasn't trying to, no. I saw him. If I can feel you, see you a little bit, I'm going to do something to ball up, not take a like, yeah. direct, direct hit. Direct hit, yeah. Come on, I was running out of bounds. I mean, this joke is here. This cheap shot. Cheap shot artist, man. That's what he is. I know it. Finish him. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't finished nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah, he finished yeah, the yeah. turf. I did. <laughs> it was bad, too. Rubber pellets, all that. <laughs> Everything. But um, you looking at it now, bro. You you went to the Falcons. Ball. Yeah. Completely ball. DVD, yeah. And... Um, now you're the owner, minority <laughs> owner yeah, yeah. of the Atlanta Falcons. You know, you played for them and now you own the team. Right, right. Minority owner. So when you, bro, like how the hell did all of that come together 360? Well, I had a really good uh, relationship with Mr. Blank. Um, I mean, the, one of the reasons I came to Atlanta and probably the only reason is because of him. You know, when I visited here and they were recruiting me during my, when I was a free agent, we talked about off the field. We never really talked about the game of football. I mean, he showed highlights of me blocking that, hey, you can protect Mike Vick running the ball. But we really just connected about the community, giving back, trying to help people. And, you know, towards the end of my career, you know, it's like my 10th, 11th year. It's like, so what are you going to do after football? He said, you want to coach? I was like, no, I don't want to be there. <laughs> what you want to do? I, I want to be up there with you. Yeah. And I just pointed up, right? And this was at practice. So I got released. You know, I, I, he talked to me, released, like, hey, whenever you finish, I would love to, you know, be a partner, call you a partner, those things. Just, you know, we'll get there. And, yeah, after that year in Tampa and came back and, you know, he met with me, like, three, two or three times, had dinner, you know, cook dinner at the house and stuff. And it's like, hey, I, you really need to do this. I want you to be a partner, this and that. And I was just like, man, you know, I wasn't the highest paid player. And, you know, I was trying to manage my my little dollars. Mm. And after a while, I just said, oh, I'll do it. I'll make it happen. So I just called my financial advisor and said, hey, what can I do? And just worked it out. And boom, that's how, that's how it all went down. 
And that's like unheard of, man. We, we talked yeah. about this on a recent episode. It's, yeah. it's so rare that former players, uh, former athletes get an opportunity to get into the ownership space of a team yeah. in that league or in a team that they previously played for. Yeah. So salute to you, bro. That's that's major. No, no. It, it, it really comes down to Mr. Blank. He's just a different, special individual. He care about his players. I mean, even today, he's he cares about those guys, what they're doing in the community, really trying to encourage them. But he's just a, a, a really good man overall. And I mean, he cares about people and community. And he's someone that I, believe me, I learned my first year here. You know, we, we were having a fundraiser, and, you know, he was like, well, come here, let me talk to you this today. I want to tell you about this. And I was like, no, no, you can talk to my executive director. He said, no, you need to, you need to sit here, let me tell you, learn yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, really opened up my eyes that you know, he's really trying to teach me something. And I told you, I'm always open to learning something and not push it off. So I, I just sat there and, and really just started to soak in things that he was telling me so I'm, I'm thankful and he's just a special human being man so he's i call him pops you know <clears throat> he's pops and he's someone that i can call anytime text anytime reach out if i need anything okay. yeah that, that's a dope relationship he his interest into the player becoming way bigger than the player responsibility outside yeah. of the field it yeah. definitely shows you know i've had some opportunity to do some work with him on some social justice things yeah. and collaborate with some things at the NFL league office. And, and I, hell, he, I feel like I played for him. <laughs> he shows me love. Yeah. Like yeah. you walk in the stadium, the homegrown section of all of the guys who came from Georgia, yeah, you're on the, you know what I'm yeah. saying? He paying yeah. tribute to yeah. that. So like, I, I'm like, look at every time I look at it, I'll be like, Mr. Blank, I appreciate you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping yeah. the legacy alive, dog. Yeah, yeah no, he's a good guy, man. Good. Good man, good man overall. And you've done some amazing things off the field as well yeah. with your charity work, done charities. Yeah. Coming up on the 25th anniversary of your program, Homes for the Holidays. Yeah, yeah. That's so huge, bro. Major, major. Man. You established it to honor your mom uh, and her dream of home ownership for single parent families. Yeah. So talk a little bit about <laughs> what that means to you. Well, I know my rookie year, Coach Dungey getting drafted by the Bucks. Uh, Coach Dungey, every year that I learned, he would always take all the rookies, put them in a room, and, and talk to them about being involved, giving back, just being a part of the community. And you know, he it's like I took that as a challenge. And honestly, I had no idea what I was going to do. But later on that night, I started really thinking about like, what can I do to help people? Right, be a part of this community. And, of course, I thought about, oh, I can give out turkeys or I can help people get ACs, AC units if they don't have air and stuff. And I was like, no, I, that's, for me, that's, that's not enough. And I thought about my mom and her journey. And that's when the whole idea came about. The next day I went to uh, Stephanie Waller, who was community relations with the Bucks at the time, and told her, this is what I want to do. Can you help me put it together? And she did. And we tried it that first year uh, on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We did three homes. And I still, I was just like, okay, I just wrote the check out of my pocket, paid for everything, and I handed the keys to the recipient. It was like, oh my God, hug me. I was like, I'm just giving you some keys to the house, <laughs> right? I mean, I didn't think it was a big deal. The next home, the lady, she picked me up and squeezed me. I, I was small and frail, right? <laughs> She just took out, knocked all the air out of me. And I just still didn't, it didn't resonate until I went home later that night and I watched the news. And I was like, wow, mm. that was impactful. Yeah. The next day I said, you know what? I wouldn't do this again, but I got to go home where it all started. And then I just started doing it. How can we do it in Baton Rouge? Went back there the next year, did it in Tampa again. So I never thought that... <clears throat> I'm, I'll be 25 years into this, helping, you know, at first it was just single moms. And then we started working with helps four single fathers in this process, then just went to single parent families. So it's just been like a growth. And you know, now understanding a lot of issues, family issues, housing issues, mm -hmm. and just really just trying to help people. Uh, it's been 
it's been rewarding, but now we got wraparound services where we're doing more of a holistic approach when it comes to financial literacy, health and wellness with scope and scholarships to, to help people that are trying to help themselves. So it's been growth. Yeah, definitely yeah. growth. 25 years, that's <clears throat> incredible, man. That's rare in a philanthropic space, uh, particularly when it comes to athletes, athletes. and former yeah, athletes, because yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of guys do unfortunately drop the ball, but that is... Very commendable, brother. Yeah, no, right. no, I appreciate it. Well, the one thing, too, when I started learning about other athletes, foundations, guy would have, oh, his sister or his mm -hmm. mom would be... The executive work, director. Yeah, yeah, executive director and those things. And I was purposely like, no, my family's not going to be a part of this. If mm -hmm. I do something like this, I want this to be, like, legit. And, you know, now you, you, you got to manage people's money and those things. So when we started the... The, the charity in 2002, I mean, I didn't want my family to be a part. They can come in and help and assist, but I didn't want to hire anybody in my family to come and be a part of it because I wanted to try to really build something and be legit. Right. So and I just wanted to be different than, like, other athletes when they were doing their things because yeah. you hear about the stories, right? Mm -hmm. And sister is working or mom is working. That's how they're getting paid. It's like, well, no, that's not how I want to do things, and I... I understand nonprofits so much today. I mean, because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just understand it so much. You know about the ratios. Every you know, the ratio should be like every from every dollar eighty. You know, eighty eighty five cent ninety cents should go towards programming. Mm -hmm. and then ten percent, ten percent or ten cent or whatever, ten fifteen cent goes to staffing. So mm -hmm. gotta manage all that. You talk about ratios. Um, the thing that really stood out to me when I was doing research on it was you noticed the gap when it comes to black Americans compared to white families of ownership of homes. Yeah. 46 with black families, 75% with white families. Yeah. And uh, you felt like you were called to be able to continue the trend to bring not only awareness to it, but change it. But why is it so important for you to help create intergenerational wealth well if you if you really think about the challenges that individuals have to to becoming a homeowner um, it's it's just crazy um, what they have to go through but for me it's all about the purposes to create stability for families and and how do you do that you, know, you got to help someone become a homeowner. That's one of the quick ways that you can work on generational wealth. But just because you get the home, it's everything else. Because we all have other bills, home maintenance, you know, you got to eat, feed the kids. So it's like budgeting, putting money aside, and really spending more money on need versus want. Mm. And once we can get to that point of living a good life and you save it for the things that you want, but take care of the everyday needs and and you know, just trying to help individuals, but passing on generational wealth, we really didn't have that ability to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, our homes were being devalued in all black communities. I mean, individuals, it was, uh, you know, we couldn't get loans, you know, it was just predatory lending, all, just all those issues to help individuals become homeowners, and that was a challenge. And mm -hmm. just trying to now have homeownership uh, classes, educating people on a, on a process. So it's it's really just now opening up and supporting people that are trying to help themselves become homeowners. And once you do that, we still generations away from passing yeah. down wealth. I Absolutely. mean, the reality of it. Mm -hmm. So, but this is the start, and we got to start somewhere. And for me, it's really setting the foundation with the kids in the household. Once they set a foundation, and now they're on their journey they see, oh, I have a stable environment. This is something I want for myself. Or the parents pass it down to them. I mean, that's how we, we can work on generational wealth. And, you know, that is a consistent, constant cycle that I think we, we miss out on those opportunities because we're thinking about, oh, I can wear Louis, Gucci, you know, I can wear all these expensive things today. Do you really need that to be a good person? I mean, is that going to make you a better person? I mean, no. I mean, that's just material things. But I think my position and attitude 
comes from, I lost my mom when I was 18 years old. Nothing else really mattered. I lost my jewel, you know, most precious thing ever. And material things really don't even matter. So I, I, that doesn't drive me to have those things. So I, I know my, what I experience really drives me to not necessarily value material things. So I think we have to educate them on the importance of what are the things that you need. You can still go and get certain things, but what do you need to live a good life? And how can we pass this on to the next generation? And then over the course of time, you build that generational wealth. It's going to take years for that to happen, though. Yeah, definitely not by accident, but you're sowing the seed and making sure you're cultivating it, too. Yeah. So, like, really appreciate that. The thing, I, correct me if I'm wrong on this number, but to this date, when you look at, you're going to be celebrating, what, 25 years? Yeah, 25 years, yeah. And you look at the, the amount of people that you've helped. Your program has rewarded over 204 single parents. 206 now. 206. 206. 206. Actually, 206, that's right. 206. 206. And over 550 dependents for achieving first-time home Home ownership ownership. nationwide, not just local, but nationwide. Yeah, 16 states, 27 cities, and, you know, it's just... just makes me speechless. But I, I think about those kids and those homes, we're, we're not just affecting them because now their cousins, other family members are impacted off that as well. So we're, we're touching a lot of people who, you know, may not be directly impacted by it, but, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times it is passed on to other people. For an example, we've had uh, recipients they get the house, mm. but they've already went shopping to buy furniture. They already have a truck. Mm. They realize they don't <laughs> need the truck, right? They go and they go and help somebody else. They passing it along to help somebody else get their journey. When mm. you do those good deeds, sometimes people, you know, continue to pass on the blessing to hey, other fool. people. Yeah, all the time. And we've had a lot of recipients say that. And you know, I just think we're not just touching one, but we're with. We're touching way more than 500 and some people because you have yeah. those family members who come in there at all a mm-hmm. lot of times. So it's a, it's a trickling, trickling effect, and I'm, I'm thankful that you know, I have the platform, one, but most importantly, you know, those individuals have actually taken the step themselves to get there. It's like we, we tell people, we're not giving you a hand out, but we'll give you a hand up. If you're trying to, you're doing your part, I'm going to do my part to help you. And I just think that's how we do it. No one gave me anything. I've had to work for everything. Mm-hmm. And then some, you know. Nothing so. was given. Oh, never. <laughs> I mean, not for a five, nine, 170-some pounder. No. Yeah. Grinding. I was about to give you that work, though, if you would have stayed in bounds. <laughs> <laughs> again, 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 again. Uh, wishing. <laughs> wishing. Hey, he's wishing. He's wishing. Right? Yeah, wishful yeah. thinking. Wishful, wishful thinking. Well, it made hey, me feel better. They say a high size twenty twenty. You blind as a bat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know he should know. I mean, like a little. I mean, I'm not trying to give you. It's a reason, right? I mean, people's like, you still walk after you know playing twelve years. You know how do you should do it? I used to get down a little fetal position underneath the power. You tackle me, I just ball up, like, <laughs> protecting myself. He did though. Yeah, I mean. I'm, I wasn't, but I also knew too when the journey's over, get down. Yeah. I mean, I'm small. Am I gonna run over you? No. Am I gonna, you know, I, I was, my legs were strong and I can fall forward a yard or two, but I wasn't trying to run over you. Yeah. I was gonna make you miss. I was gonna sit you down. I was gonna, you know. And he Coach Bowden, too. yeah. Oh, he he always mad about that. But I got him in college too. He got mad. Yeah. <gasps> He was holding. He was holding. <laughs> Referee <Yeah. and> call it. <laughs> but now I was going to say, Coach Bowden, he always says, don't ever just run out of bounds. Lower the shoulder as you're going out of bounds. I always try to get that extra yard. So, mm. you know, those are things. I always try to just fall forward um, when I was running. And that led to your autobiography, Running For My Life. I was literally running for my running life. Running for my <laughs> life. <laughs> I was running for my life. Classic, perfect, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But it dealt with uh, 
your journey, uh, some depression and yeah. grief processes after yeah. your mom passed away in a line of duty. Um, what was one piece of advice that your mom gave you that you still live by, sticks with you today? Well, she gave me so much being the oldest, mm -hmm. right? I was having these adult conversations just about life. But uh, for me, I wouldn't say advice. She always challenged me mm. you know, on just different things. For an example, my freshman year of high school, yeah, I had a .9 GPA. .9 GPA. Is that even possible? It's possible. I did it. And no, the you had to try to get a point nine. <laughs> there is no way... <laughs> Listen, I, I'm telling you, I had a .9 GPA, and why? Because I went to all boys Catholic private school, and I went to school in the beginning, the fried chicken and PE. Okay, it was fun. It was it was good, and I never brought home books. I went to public school. I brought I never brought home books. Three five. My mom was like, "How are you making the grades?" So I was just like, "That eh, fine," but. She told me I couldn't play football anymore, so she was like, what do you want to do? I can take you out. We can go back to public school, and, and you know, everything would be fine. Or you can stay here, and, you know, you're going to prove to these people that you can do it. And I was just like, you know what? I'm a, I'll, I'll stay and prove to them that I, that I can do it. And I first time I ever went to summer school, and then my grades started gradually coming up. When you're a point nine, you're not just going to jump to 2 0, right? You're going to, I had a like 1.4 in the next, you know, so it just gradually came up. I went to summer school, and then I started off my sophomore year with almost a 3.0. And that was it. I was just, you had to get into a routine, yeah. you, you know, just push yourself. So, like I said, the advice piece, she just challenged me, right? And I had to grow up really fast because, again, we had a dog. I was having a dog conversations, and my responsibility was really my five brothers and sisters. So that was like, you know, having a conversation with her. It's like, did did they eat? Are they in the bed? Is this thing? They did the homework, and you know, I was dead, you know, at a young age. So, um, yeah, because. Your mom, she was murdered while you was yeah. in high school. Yeah, yeah. My, two days after my 18th birthday, my mom was working overtime. She was Baton Rouge City police officer. She was only making like $36,000 a year, and she had to work extra job security. And I had a conversation, and I mentioned this before. I, I had a conversation with her like at 8, 30, 9 o'clock. It was the routine call. Hey, is everybody in bed? I was like, your mind, everybody ate, everybody did their homework, everybody's getting in bed. And I'm I was in my mom's bed waiting on her. I said, I'm in your bed. I'm I'm waiting on you to get home. Hang up. You know, a couple hours later, I get a phone call. I said my mom had been shot. So life changing. And um it, it changed me forever. But I just think through those years, she was really preparing me for something like that happen. And you know, how do you respond over the years? Yeah. I didn't have time to mourn or cry because I had to be strong for my other brothers and sisters. And just over the course of time, you know, I ended up saying, okay, I go to Florida State trying to raise your brothers and sisters, you know, three and a half, four, five and a half hours away. And my life changed because in Tampa, I never really, I went out. I didn't smile. I didn't laugh. I, I wasn't out having a great time. But my brothers and sisters were there, too, the youngest three. But when I came to Atlanta and I heard Sean Jefferson, who was a receiver at the time, talk about a guy going to counseling to play football, I was, yeah. just, I was just like in the locker room, going to counseling to play football? Yeah, I can do this in my sleep. And later on that night, I talked to a friend who helped me find a counselor. So I, I found someone, and I, you know, of course, I was ashamed. I didn't tell anybody. I went to the back door. I did, you know, all those things. And, you know, going in, went in and, you know, didn't realize that I was just coasting through life. I was depressed, you know, just all those things. And I was ashamed to tell people that I was going to counseling. So it just took a couple of years before I actually shared that. But I just started to get to a, a different place in my life. 
and um, just battling uh, depression and talk about mental health. You know, black communities, that's not common. And athletes, we're supposed Terrible. to be strong. Mm -hmm. We're superior. Yeah, so... You know, I wasn't going to mention that, but, I, you know, after a while I said, hell with it. I'm, I'm confident who I am. Mm -hmm. And I did this interview with Andrea Kramer talking about going to counseling and, and how my life changed. But then I got to the point of, like, I want to go see the guy who shot and killed my mom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just searching for that peace, and I was on that journey. And, you know, that's when Running for Your Life came out, and I talk about just that whole journey of sitting down face to face with the guy who shot and killed my mom and asking, you know, told him I forgave him so I can move on with my life. You know, it just took a lot of counseling, a lot of years, but just at a different place. I wanted to take the power back, you yeah. know, and, and live my life and not let someone control my life who... Because there's so much know. anger that was... Oh, yeah, because when it first happened, what's the first thing we I lived with? In the hood, so it's just mm -hmm. like... You, everybody wants street justice, right? And, you know, it was like, no, you, you look after them. That's your thing, you know? And I thank God the guys were caught and stuff, so nothing crazy happened in the streets, but, yeah, I, I couldn't focus on the negativity. I had to make sure I take care of her kids, be there for them, do everything I can. And now, two days after my 18th birthday, I'm parent, you're like full time parent, and not just big brother anymore. So, it's challenges, but you know, over the course of the years, manage. Right? What can we do, or what can be done? Just hearing your story, and you just made me think about this, to not only increase the awareness, but to be more active in changing the thought process of the black male, as far as just coming out yeah. saying, like, man, it's okay to get help. Yeah, well, I, I think most importantly, you gotta, other people gotta tell their story, share their journey, and not be afraid of what other people are gonna say. I mean, people are jealous all the time, but if I'm really focused on what someone else has to say, it's gonna always hold me back, right? I'm, I'm not looking for confirmation from anybody. I mean, I'm confident in myself, and, and I would tell people, we have to do things for ourselves sometimes to get to a certain place. I'm not saying that you don't take advice or you don't listen to people because you need to ask questions. We don't know everything, but we have to be open to something different. And I just believe in myself enough that you know I don't care about what anyone else has to say. Like, if I was playing today in the social media world, it, I, you can say whatever you want about me online. I mean... It wouldn't even bother me because I know I am on the field doing this work. You're not out here. If you were that good to be out here, you would be out here too. <laughs> right. Facts. So it's like, you know, people judging you that are watching the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, nobody's perfect. We all gonna make mistakes. I mean, like, he made a mistake when he tried to tackle me <laughs> and he missed, right? I mean, yeah, I'm just saying. We all get grace <laughs> by you jumping up like a gazelle in the air. Cause I was like, my point. That's my point. That's my point, right? Everybody make mistakes, and nobody's perfect. And you know, we just all gotta accept each other for who we are. And he needs to accept the fact that he ain't gonna ever hit me. You know <laughs> I don't like how y'all just like. Double team. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying. Hey, I'm just saying. You know what I'm you saying? Gotta, you, gotta, you, you got a minute lounge now. You got to forgive him for embarrassing you, man. It's all good, bro. That'll help yeah. you. Oh, yeah. I forgive you. Y'all <laughs> <laughs> uh, just want you to know they killed me in the film room. <laughs> Brian Simmons. What? Adrian Ross. Steve Foley. Yeah, they what did like, say? Spice, how did that work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> Everlasting, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic. I know the backstory on that. That's good to know. That's good Classic. to know. Yeah. You know, you know, you try some things. Like, we try things, and it may work, it may not. Yeah. That didn't work that yeah. day. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's good. It's cool. I still love you, man. You know, you my dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Because you said you did something with the uh, police as well, right? Sorry about that. You were on a call earlier. Well, that I was on a national council and police and race just talking, you know, just trying to not hear with the defund. Nobody talk about defund. Mm. 
but how can we improve um, that everybody's held accountable, right? And uh, help police be better, not <clears throat> hinder their progress, but help them be better. I mean, I'm, I'm going to defend police all the time because my mom was a police officer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my mom would also call a spade a spade. That yeah. was wrong, right? Uh, you know, this or that. So, you know, I just wanted to, you know, lend my point of view of what I learned from my mom all those years of how she community police, you know, she didn't take everybody to jail. You know, mm -hmm. she was, she gave people opportunities. She just, she cared about the people in her community. And police officers, um, they're a big part of our community. I mean, we, we're we friends with a bunch of them. I mean, you know, you have good cops and you have bad cops. It's mm -hmm. like, how do we help better assist them, train them, mental health, just stresses they de they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Give but them that support to them as well. Yeah, and so we got to support them. But we also, we have to hold each other accountable. And that's I, I think that's important. So, But we also got to, how do we protect them? I mean, I was talking about the... You know, you, you don't need a permit to carry. I mean, yeah. that, you know, that's, that's that puts more yeah. stress, I, I would say, on police officers. Yeah. Because, you know, you can walk around and, you know, they can't arrest you or can't do anything. I mean, it's just, it's just tough. It's tough. So, You come with a lot of wealth and knowledge just from your past circumstances, your experiences. Yeah. But looking back, what advice would you give your younger self? Hmm, my younger self? Um, I wish I would have went to counseling sooner. Yeah, you got to think. I, I didn't go to counseling to 10 years after my mom had passed. And that's when I started that journey. If that was something that was there for me early on, and I was open to going. I think uh, I would have probably just been in a different place, and yeah, I could probably could have been a better football player, or you know, just just better overall. Because mm. yeah, you're doing those ten years when you're depressed, you're keeping everything inside. So I'm I'm not necessarily I can't tell you everything that happened. During, a, during that time, you have to talk about things for a little bit. Then, oh, okay, then, it, then you jog my memory. It's mm -hmm. like you suppress things because you're depressed. Because I wasn't trying to live, you know, relive 1993 all over again. And I didn't have an outlet to express myself. So if I could have went to counseling earlier, you know, I wouldn't, you know, want to suppress, a, a, you know, some vital years of my life, definitely in college, because that's supposed to be the best years, you know, experiencing those things. You know, I could have had a better college life. I never went out. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything. I yeah. just played football. I went to school, played football, ran track. And three weekends, I drove home to Baton Rouge. I mean, that was it. So, yeah, I wish I could have, you know, really enjoyed life a little bit more because I know I missed out on a lot of things. And with that um, amazing NFL career on the field, made some of the greats miss you and, and look kind of silly out there. Yeah. <laughs> Doing some incredible things off the field and uh, right. your transition. Yeah. Helping former NFL players transition with the Legends community as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, minority owner with the Atlanta Falcons. So all of these incredible things, work done is continuing to define his dash. What do you want your legacy to be when it's all said and done? I just want to be known as I was a cool dude, you know. <laughs> I'm, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I try to take my pain and really help people, you know, and not experience what I went through, or, or uh, I don't want other parents to experience you know, a kid's experience, what I went through, losing my mom. So I, for me, if I, if I could um, really just help people improve their lives and be better, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm just, I just tell people all the time, I'm just a cool dude, just cool, chill, cool dude, laid back. I just Under the, the radar. I just try to fly, you know, <laughs> under the radar. You Stealth know? mode. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, I, I'm, I have an opinion, I'll tell you how I feel, you know, uh, be transparent, but just, I just want to live a good life, help people, and, you know, uh, continue to heal and continue down my journey of helping other people, so create positive relationships, you know, it's just, just trying to be, uh, just, I'm always just trying to be my best. Man, we appreciate that, bro, because it takes a lot to be able to, you know, to be candid and, and we all come from the macho man, the ego, the, the, yeah. you know, the egotistical sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to go behind the mask and, and, and really share some of the things, bro, I salute you. We appreciate it. And mm -hmm. we also going to salute the reason why we're here today. Not because you jumped up in the air and I miss <laughs> you, but because... 25 years of yes, existence indeed. in the game. 25 years, baby. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Appreciate that, man. Many more. Only the beginning. Didn't think I'd get 25 years. You know, I wasn't even thinking one year. Yeah. But 25, man, it's a blessing. Blessing. But it takes partnerships, relationships, you know, people supporting. I know we have golf tournaments and other fundraisers. You guys come out. Just appreciate you guys' support. And, you know, we just got to continue to grow and help people. Community, if people need help. We got to educate our people. So let's just keep keep pushing. You're doing exactly that, brother. Salute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Behind the mask.